morning. It's a great day to be a child of God, to rejoice and to be glad in it, because God is good and all the time. Amen. What a privilege to be able to stand before you and to preach God's word. Daniel and uh, Aurora and family are on vacation in Zion. I'm not sure where Zion is, but it looks pretty nice in the pictures. And uh, we'll look forward to them coming back. Let me say before we get into the message, one of the strangest things that ever happened to me was that uh, in 1987, when I moved to Michigan, they had fired the preacher before me. And he did everything he could to overturn the decision of the elders. They had tried to get him to resign. He had refused. He was someone who should have never been in the pulpit to begin with. And uh, when they asked him to resign, he refused. He forced them to fire him. Then he did everything he could to create trouble on the way out. Well, then three years later, the eldership that had hired me, two of them had died and one had moved. In the new eldership, one of the two elders was the best friend of the preacher that had been fired. And as we continued with my preaching, he never said anything about the preaching or anything. And one day I mentioned to his wife, I appreciate the fact that even though uh, Dave doesn't uh, like my preaching, that uh, he supports me. And she looked at me and she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I know Dave really doesn't like me. He said, he loves your preaching. He thinks your preaching is great. He had never said a word. 28 years later, when I retired, he moved. He, he came all the way from Tennessee to be at our going away party. And I didn't know until his wife told me that he not only, you know, tolerated my preaching, but he actually really liked it. You need to tell Daniel. I can say this now that he's not here. If you appreciate Daniel's preaching and teaching as much as I do, I have been absolutely amazed at the growth that we have seen in Daniel's preaching and in his teaching. And, and I'll tell you, I don't know that I've ever seen a preacher with a better work ethic. You see, most of what a preacher does, nobody sees. And there are preachers that coast through the week and put something together Saturday night and then get up and, and, and try to do the best they can without any preparation. And, I've, and I don't think I've ever seen a preacher with a better work ethic than Daniel's, with a better attitude, and I am just so thankful that he is here. There's nothing more frustrating than to work and pray to build up a congregation and then see the man that comes in behind you tear down what you build up. And it is such an amazing fortune we have. We are trying to hire a preacher today in any church, whether it's a church of Christ or any other church. Every church in America is losing preachers faster than their training preachers. And it is through God's grace that we have Daniel. And I hope that you will remember to let him know how much you appreciate the work that he does. I keep thinking of uh, when disciples of John came to Jesus and, and uh, read to John and said, Master, don't, uh, the disciples of Jesus are, making more, are baptizing more than we are. And he said, well, for that's the reason I came. He must increase and I must decrease. And I remember Batsel Barrett Baxter in 1968 telling us that's the attitude that every servant of God should have. And I am so grateful that Daniel is here to build on what you all have built over the years. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. That's where we're going to be today. And in Romans chapter 8, we have an answer to one of the most perplexing problems that Christians have to deal with. When we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, if we begin back in chapter 7 and verse 15 and following, we see that Paul begins by, uh, by telling us about his efforts to get right with God through his own efforts. And you can summarize all of the last half of chapter 7 by saying, the harder I tried, the more I messed up. Until finally he cries out, oh, miserable wretch that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? But then in chapter 8 and verse 1, the good news starts. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now. Don't forget the little words when you're studying God's word. Many times we skip over the little words and we don't see the significance of them. Now, there is now 
before I tried and I tried and I failed and I tried and I failed, but there is now that I'm a Christian, there is now no condemnation. The word condemnation means to pronounce the penalty. If there is no judgment, there is no condemnation. God does not pronounce a penalty for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, now I'm under the law of the spirit of life instead of sin and death, and, and, and I'm in Jesus Christ, so there's no condemnation. And not only that, in verse 16, he says, he says, and the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Look at that in verse 16. The spirit himself, he's emphasized. He doesn't just say, the spirit bears witness. The spirit himself. The spirit personally stands by me, as I say, God, you are my father, and the Spirit puts his arm around me and says, God, he's right. He's one of your children. The Spirit himself bears witness what he has seen with our spirit that we are children of God. And so when you stand up and say, God, I'm your fa- you're my father, I'm a father, then God says, is he really my child? The Holy Spirit himself is saying, this is one of your children. And so he continues and he says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. If God, well, you know, uh, uh, I didn't inherit much when, when my father passed away. My father had, he bragged one time that he had spent enough money on booze to buy three houses. And when my father died, everything that he owned was in a box. Everything he owned, because he had spent it all on booze. Fortunately, he came back to the Lord before he died, but, you know, the prices had already been paid for his lifestyle. But look, imagine the inheritance. He says, and not everything comes in a box. If children of God, then heirs, we inherit from the God of the universe. Fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified in. For I consider... The suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed in us. Here is the question that every new Christian is confronted with. God, if I'm your child, if you've forgiven me, if your spirit declares to you, this is one of your children, then why do I still suffer? You know, when, when I was, many years ago, there was a song out that said, uh, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Where did, but, but yet how many people became Christians think I become a Christian, all of my troubles will go away? How do we get that idea when the one that we've committed to, Jesus Christ, did all of his troubles go away? And yet somehow we myopically think that if I just become a Christian, all of my troubles will go away. And the irony of it is that Satan will do his worst on you right after you become a child of God. When was it that Satan attacked Jesus directly? Right after he was baptized. Why is that? Because when we're born again, that means we start our life as babies learning to walk the Christian life. And if we're babies learning to walk the Christian life, Satan is a liar and a coward. He'd much rather pick on a baby than pick on a full-grown Christian. And so he's going to go after you. And you look around you, and not only those challenges you have, but we live in a world full of suffering, as beautiful as much of this world is. Look at suffering. You want to really mess up your day. Go, go, Go to Facebook or YouTube and start looking at YouTubes of animals eating each other in Africa. I mean, that's the world that we live in. It's a world where there are problems and challenges. How do we deal with these challenges and not give up? Well, the Apostle Paul has the answer when he says, For I consider, I'll stop right there with that word, I consider. This word consider, logizomai, is a word the King James translates reckon, which always made me suspect the King James translators were Southerners. Because you know the Southerners reckon a lot. I went to school at David Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee back in the 60s. And back in those days, the South was much more balkanized. The Northerners hadn't moved South yet. I was the first Yankee some of those people had ever met. Some of them didn't even know Yankee was a standalone word. So so I'm meeting these people, and I met my roommate from Sheffield, Alabama. He's walking down the hall in Old Elam Hall, uh, where we were our residency, and he's yelling, Roll Tide, and the bear walks on water. 
I had no idea what a roll tide was, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out why a bear would walk on water. I had never even heard of Bear Bryant. You see, to people in Alabama, this may sound, uh, sound blasphemous, Bear Bryant was the fourth member of the Godhead. In those days. And, and, and so here he is, roll tide and bear, walked on the water. And I remember the first time someone said, uh, can I carry y'all downtown? And I looked around and I thought, it's just me. Who's y'all? And then I thought, why would you carry me? You have a car. Instead of, could I give you a ride downtown? It's can I carry y'all downtown? Well, Southerners reckon a lot. And the King James Version says, I reckon. And that's actually a good translation because the word reckon means to establish by counting or calculation. In other words, when, when Paul says, I consider, what he's really saying is, I have run the numbers. I've added up the pluses, and I've included the minuses, and I have found the conclusion. I have found the total. He says, I consider, I have run the numbers, and what I have learned is that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed in us. I have run the numbers, and believe you me, Paul had really run the numbers. Paul had considered the suffering of this present world. Get, get this idea of what Paul had been through in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11. Beginning, uh, let's begin about verse 24. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day uh, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger in the sea, in danger among false brethren, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. When Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time, man, he knew what he was talking about. And you can look at the Apostle Paul, and when I read, the first time I read that account of Paul and what he had gone through many years ago, I thought, Paul, why didn't you just say, I give up and I quit, it's not worth it. And Paul gives the answer in this verse for why we don't quit in difficult times. He says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. He's saying, I'm not just looking at here and now. I remember the story a number of years ago of a preacher friend who was in a hospital. And he was in, uh, he was in the IC unit. And he asked one of the nurses that he had knew. He said, how are you doing today? And she said, not very well. Uh, she said, uh, she said uh, I'm not doing very well. She said, preacher, if I don't get some answers today, I'm going to end up in the hospital myself. I just can't take it anymore. Her problem was the word today. Her problem, and I'm not belittling or taking for granted what she was saying, but her problem was she was focused on today. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of today, this present time, are not worth being compared to the glory that's to be revealed in us. In other words, heaven is worth it all. We're not worth comparing to the glory. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Listen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Well, how does that help us? Who for the, who, how did he endure the cross? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame thereof, and is even now seated at the right hand of God. Paul, Jesus was able to endure the cross because he considered that the suffering of the cross was not worth being compared to the glory of untold millions of people being brought to eternity in a new heaven and a new earth. And this is what we have to look forward to. Keep your eyes on the prize. Even God's own son suffered uh, in, in, in this world, and yet he endured it all because it was worth it. There's a cartoon from Theophilus where the man's standing at the grave, 
And he says, he's really gone. Where was God when my son died, Theophilus? And he said, right where he was when his own son died on the cross. Where is God when we're suffering? He's preparing us for a greater weight of glory. For the creation waits. Look at verse 19. He says, for, why? Because the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The word longing here means to stretch your neck out to look. And it says the whole creation is looking forward to what? He says to, to, the, to the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who suggested it, who subjected it in hope. What is this about? That verse really looks confusing, doesn't it? Who's the one who has subjected the, the creation to futility? It's actually God. But he did it. In hope. You see, the situation is, as Burton Kaufman said, this is a reference to God who alone had the authority and power to subject the creation to vanity and also the option of totally destroying man because of sin or subjecting him in hope for his redemption. God had a choice when Adam and Eve sinned. He could destroy Adam and Eve and with them all of, the, all of mankind, or he could allow them to continue to live in a now broken and fallen world and, and offer the hope of something better in the future. In verses 21 and 23, he says, uh, uh, as we continue, he says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage and corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth to now. The pains we see now, now, uh, if, if, have you ever had an 11 centimeter kidney stone? Or millimeter, rather. A centimeter, man, that'd be big. Have you ever had an 11 millimeter kidney stone? The nurse told me, honey, that is the closest you're ever going to come to having a child. Well, at least I didn't have to take the kidney stone home with me. But <laughs> I didn't have to support it for the next 18 years. That's what I'm thinking. I, you know, uh, if that's the kind of pain women have, I understand why God decided women should have children. If men had children, there would have never been a second generation not with pain like that and the lower tolerance of pain that you and I have. But when I look at this and I think of, of the pain, when I talk to women who have had children, they're in such excruciating, terrible pain. They're angry at their husband. Look what the mess you got me into. You're going to pay for this. And then a the child shows up and suddenly you forget about all the pain. And it was all worth it. As the nurse comes in and lays that child on the mother's breast, all of the pain just doesn't matter anymore, does it? And what he's saying about the pain and the suffering of this world is we are now in the, st in the stage of childbearing, of delivery, if you will, to a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so the suffering of this world is preparing this world to pass away and to be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. For the creation, was, he says in, in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now see, our spirit has already been redeemed. But what we're looking forward to now is the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is not seen, that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? What we are looking forward to that we have not seen yet is such an amazing thing. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, you know, when I look at what we're looking forward to, it, it, it just makes the wait worth it. I remember as a boy, five years old, my grandfather to me was the greatest, wisest, biggest, strongest man on the face of the earth. And he would sit on the, the second step of, of, uh, of, the stairs, uh, of the stairs of a morning as the traffic's going by on, on Route 21, which, which uh, was the main thoroughfare from, from Cleveland to Miami in those days. And he would read his paper with his elbows on his knees. And so I'm sitting next to him with my elbows on my knees I looked up at him and I said, Grandpa, wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus would come right now and we could be together forever? 
I was a fi at five years old, I was groaning, thinking there's, better, there's something even better than this. And so we look forward to that time. In 1 Corinthians 15, ver beginning in verse 42, he explains what that redemption of the body is going to look like. Beginning in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to turn over there to verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, that's an earthy body of dirt, there, dust, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam gave us our bodies, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, gave us our spirits. Every word used to describe the resurrection body is a word that describes perfection. Dick Cavett once was asked, interviewed uh, after his retirement as one of the afternoon talk show hosts, said, what was the strangest thing that ever happened to you that had to be edited out of the show? He said, I was interviewing the editor of Prevention Magazine, and he bragged, he had just made the boast that he was so confident of the principles set forth in, principle mag the, in Prevention Magazine that he thoroughly expected to live to be 101 years old. Dick Cavett said, I turned to my left to talk to the other guest, and when I turned back to the editor, he was dead in his seat. Yeah. You're going to put it all in this body. <laughs> you, you, you're in for a shock. God has so much in store for us. In verses 47 to 48, uh, he, he says, uh, The first Adam was from the earth, a man of dust. The second Adam is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also will be those who are dust. As is the man of heaven, so also were those from heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Brothers, I tell you, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. When Paul says, I tell you a mystery, what he's saying is, this has never been revealed before. What is it? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trump will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the body must put on imperishable, the mortal must put on immortality. What is this body that we're going to receive? In Second John chapter, th uh, First John rather chapter three, verse two, Paul John said, "Beloved, we are God's children now." What are we now? We're God's children. What will we be? What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he, Jesus, is pure. He's saying in this that, 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 that there's a great transformation coming. And Paul says, when I consider the suffering of this world, it's not worth being compared to what God has in store for us. Right now we look like Adam, and our wives look like Mrs. Adam, whatever, uh, Eve. But we are going to look like God. In Philippians, Jesus, Philippians 3.19, he says, uh, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory is their shame, their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from this we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope. Hope is, is not, uh, there's not an element of doubt in, in the Bible word for hope. It is confident expectation for that which we do not yet have. And in Romans 8, 24 to 25, there's hope for a new body that saves us from discouragement. In Romans 8, 26 to 27, there's the hope of answered prayer that saves us from discouragement because the Spirit himself bears witness with us. In Romans 8, 28, there's the hope that God is in control of the future and will work it out for good. We live in discouraging times. You want to read the news every morning when you get up, it's a good way to ruin your day. But you know what? There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. And right now we're in the birth pains. And as painful as it is, 
when that day comes, just like the mother who forgot about all of the suffering when the baby was laid on her breast, when we see Jesus, it's all going to be forgotten. And we're going to go to a place where the book of Revelation says, in Revelation uh, chapter, uh, chapter 21, he says, he says, and I heard a loud voice uh, from, from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor pain, nor crying, nor pain any more for the former things have passed away. Paul says, I've run the numbers. I've added up the, the positives and I've included the negatives. And I have concluded, I have considered, I have reckoned that none of it is worth being compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Perhaps you're, you're here today and you find yourself in a situation where you're not ready to face that as a future. Perhaps you're not a Christian yet. You're not a child of God. If you're not a child of God, none of what I said applies to you. But if you are a child of God, all of these blessings are yours. Perhaps you're here today and you're not a child of God and you're ready to begin your walk with Jesus, which begins with believing in Christ, turning from your old life, being baptized into Christ, and rising to walk a new life. If you're ready to be baptized today, the water's ready. We can baptize you today. You could come forward while we're singing this next song. Tell me that you're ready to commit your life to Christ and be baptized and rise a new life. We'd all sing a few songs while we change you into your baptismal garments. Baptize you this morning. Perhaps you need prayer for some reason. If there's any way that we can help you, please come and talk to me while we stand and sing this song.